Welcome to Unity Group's fourth quarter 2023 conference call. My name is Gigi and I'll be your operator for today. A webcast of this call will be available on the company's website www.unity.com beginning today and will remain available for 14 days. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Participants on the call will have the opportunity to ask questions following the company's prepared comments. The company would like to remind you that today's remarks include forward-looking statements and actual results could differ materially from those projected in these statements. The factors that could cause actual results to differ are discussed in the company's filings with the SEC. The company's remarks this morning will reference slides posted on its website, and you are encouraged to refer to those materials during this call. Discussions during the call will also include certain financial measures that were not prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Reconciliations of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures can be found in the company's current report on Form 8K dated today. I will now like to turn the call over to Unity Group's Chief Executive Officer, Kenny Gunderman. Please go ahead, Mr. Gunderman. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. Starting on slide three, I'd like to begin with a review of 2023 and particularly some highlights of a very busy fourth quarter. During the year, despite a challenging backdrop, we successfully refinanced $3.1 billion of debt, resulting in our current business plan now being fully funded, having no significant debt maturities until 2027, and over 95% of our debt being fixed rate. We accomplished this while continuing to demonstrate the resiliency of our core recurring fiber business, with top-line growth of 5% in 2023, including Unity Leasing Lease-Up and Unity Fiber Enterprise and Wholesale growth of 20%, 15%, and 9% respectively, with continued declining capital intensity. Just as importantly, by addressing our balance sheet, we afforded ourselves the ability to focus on strategic matters. As we foreshadowed during our third quarter call, we recently sold some non-core assets that included our remaining tower portfolio, our remaining investment interest in Bluebird Network, and our sell leaseback with Cable South for total proceeds of $87 million and almost 10 times blended EBITDA multiple. Also, during the fourth quarter, we decided to largely exit the non-core one-time equipment sale business. As a, as a reminder, this business represents reselling of networking and other IT equipment. Historically, that business has generated anywhere between $20 and $30 million of annual revenue with margins of 15% or less, thus representing less than 5% of our total adjusted EBITDA. Despite the, the small contribution to profitability, the unpredictable nature of the business regularly contributes to the majority of volatility we see in our quarterly earnings, including the most recent third and fourth quarters. As an example, approximately 6 million of contracted equipment sales that were expected to be realized in the fourth quarter of 2023 have slipped into 2024, largely due to delayed USAC funding. On a go-forward basis, one-time equipment sales will now be a negligible part of our results, as we'll only pursue those sales that are part of an important fiber network sale and are desired by our important customers. De-emphasizing this business is also coincidental with the one-time ETL fees related to the T-Mobile Sprint merger being largely completed in 2023 and should also have a minimal impact on earnings on a go-forward basis. Finally, as we also foreshadowed on our third quarter earnings call, we just announced an ABS bridge financing that will provide funding of up to $350 million. Paul will elaborate further on this, but it's an exciting development which reinforces that fiber truly is a mission-critical communication asset. We believe that ABS will be an important value-creative financing option going forward. Turning to slide four, with our industry-leading 0.3% churn and no legacy services weighing us down, we believe our runway for mid-single-digit growth continues to be long. Our primary focus continues to be executing on our lease-up strategy via lit and dark fiber solutions for our wholesale and enterprise customers within our southeast footprint, while also further monetizing our long-haul national network through long-term IRU agreements with hyperscalers, domestic and international carriers, and other large national strategic accounts. 
Slide five illustrates that we expect our growth will continue to be disciplined and profitable. Our substantially underutilized fiber network is helping drive our shared infrastructure economics with continued declining capital intensity. Our anchor plus lease up model is working, driving cumulative cash flow yields today of 25%, a more than three and a half times increase from the anchor yield of these projects. Turning to slide six, we continue to grow our 140,000 route mile network. Less than 25% of our available network is lit today, and as we've mentioned before, we own dark metro fiber in about 300 markets nationwide, which represents terrific capital and margin efficient, efficient growth potential for enterprise wireless backhaul and small cells. We continue to believe that the wireless carriers will eventually need to densify these non-NFL markets and Unity is well positioned for that growth in the future. Slide 7 shows that the majority of our revenue is wholesale in nature, which comes with longer term contracts, lower churn, and less required overhead for execution. As a result, our business and underlying performance are less susceptible to macroeconomic conditions, and we're diversified across numerous use cases for fiber and customer segments. As an example, even though wireless carriers have recently been spending less as a collective group, than they have in past years, the decline is offset by other buyers such as hyperscalers, internet providers, and fiber of the home providers. We continue to see more use cases related to artificial intelligence as well. Turning to slide eight, scale matters in fiber, especially with a wholesale heavy business like ours. Having an own national network is a meaningful competitive advantage for Unity, and our ability to deploy dark fiber and wave services present Unity with a unique low risk growth opportunity with minimal competition. Slide 9 illustrates our continued balanced approach to bookings between Anchor and Lisa. We had a healthy level of bookings in 2023 and the interest in our network remains robust as our sales funnel remains very strong and underscores the growing demand for fiber. As a result, wholesale bookings can appear lumpy given those deals are largely are typically larger and fewer in quantity. It is not uncommon for one wholesale deal to materially impact bookings in a single quarter from a timing perspective. In fact, our funnel suggests we expect to see multiple sizable new contract wins over the coming months, especially from hyperscalers preparing for generative AI. Turning to slide 10, our enterprise strategy is highly disciplined and regional in nature. As you can see from the map, we're only offering enterprise services in approximately 30 metros concentrated in the southeast which has very favorable demographics. Our local brand is very strong in this region, helping to contribute to industry-leading enterprise churn of around 0.7%. Although enterprise sales represent about 5% of our total revenue today, and will likely always represent a minority percentage, it remains a critical element of our profitable lease-up strategy. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Paul. Thank you, Kenny. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by reviewing our fourth quarter performance, followed by an overview of our 2024 outlook. Unity had another solid year of performance in 2023, with our core recurring strategic fiber business growing at a healthy 5%, while consolidated net success-based capital intensity continues to decline, ending the year at 34%. As expected, non-recurring revenue was lower in 2023 versus 2022 due to lower ETL fee activity, primarily primarily related to fewer lit and dark fiber disconnects from the Sprint T-Mobile merger, and to lower one-time equipment sales. We mentioned on our last earnings call that the exact timing of non-recurring revenue and related margins can be difficult to predict and thus can fluctuate from quarter to quarter. As Kenny already discussed, given the low margin and tough to predict nature of one-time equipment sales, we've made the conscious decision not to actively pursue these types of sales going forward. Despite these one-time sales headwinds in the fourth quarter, our full year 2023 adjusted EBITDA and AFFO were essentially in line with our prior guidance. As I will cover in more detail shortly, our 2024 outlook reflects the robust trends we continue to see in our recurring business, the planned exit from most one-time equipment sales, and the impact from the recently announced ABS bridge financing and asset sales. Finally, I'll end with additional commentary on our current balance sheet and capital structure. <clears throat> Please turn to slide 11 and I'll start with comments on the fourth quarter. We reported consolidated revenues of $286 million, consolidated adjusted EBITDA of $231 million, 
AFFO contributed to common shareholders of $92 million and AFFO per diluted common share of $0.34. Cents. Net income attributable to common shareholders for the quarter was approximately $30 million or $0.13 cents per diluted share. At Unity Leasing, we reported segment revenues of $215 million and adjusted EBITDA of $209 million, representing growth of approximately 3% for each in the fourth quarter of 2023 compared to the prior year period. Accordingly, Unity Leasing achieved an adjusted EBITDA margin of 97% for the quarter. Turning to slide 12, our growth capital investment program continues to provide positive results for Unity. Over the past nine years, our tenant has invested over $1 billion of tenant capital improvements in our network. Unity continues to invest its own capital in long-term value accretive fiber, largely focused on highly valuable last mile fiber. Collectively, these investments have resulted in 25,500 route miles of newly constructed fiber and over 24% of the legacy copper network being overbuilt with fiber. Based on the investments made to date, and our expectation that Windstream will utilize most, if not all, of the GCI program, we expect, expect that nearly half of the legacy copper network will be overbuilt with fiber by 2030. During the fourth quarter, Unity Leasing deployed approximately $23 million towards growth capital investment initiatives, with the majority of the investments relating to the Windstream GCI program. As expected, Windstream did reach the 2023 GCI funding limit of $250 million in October of last year. As of December 31st, Unity has invested approximately $794 million of capital to date under the GCI program with Windstream, adding around 19,500 route miles and 1.1 million strand miles of fiber to our network. These investments will be added to the master leases at an 8% initial yield at the one-year anniversary of Unity making such investment. They are subject to a 0.5% annual escalator and result in nearly 100% margin. The investments we have made to date will ultimately generate approximately $64 million of annualized cash rent and increase the overall value of our network. For full year 2023, we turned over 728 lit backhaul, dark fiber, and small cell sites for our wireless carriers across the, the southeast footprint at Unity Fiber. These installs add annualized revenues of approximately $7.4 million. We currently have 725 lit backhaul, dark fiber, and small cell sites remaining in our backlog that we expect to deploy over the next few years. This wireless backlog represents an incremental $6 million of annualized revenues. At Unity Fiber, we reported revenues of $71 million and adjusted EBITDA of $27 million during the fourth quarter, achieving margins of 38%. Revenue and adjusted EBITDA during the quarter were lower than expected due to the timing of one-time equipment sales. Slide 13 provides a detailed reconcilia reconciliation of our 2023 prior outlook to 2023 actual results. This reconciliation illustrates the impact of one-time equipment sales on our 2023 results and highlights the fact that our core recurring business performed in line with our expectations. Unity Fiber net success-based CapEx was $21 million in the fourth quarter. We also incurred about $2 million of maintenance CapEx during the quarter. Please turn to slide 14 and I'll now cover our 2024 guidance. Our 2024 outlook includes the estimated impact from the recent ABS bridge financing, the planned exit of most one-time equipment sales, the recently completed asset sales, and the upcoming maturity of our 4% exchangeable notes due June 2024. Our outlook excludes future acquisitions, capital market transactions, and future transaction related and other costs not specifically mentioned herein. Actual results could differ materially from these forward-looking statements. Our full year outlook for 2024 includes the following for each segment. Beginning with Unity Leasing, we expect revenues and adjusted EBITDA to be $874 million and $847 million, respectively, for the mid, at the midpoint, representing adjusted EBITDA margins of approximately 97%. As a result of the recent asset sales, we will no longer recognize revenue and adjusted EBITDA in 2024 related to the Cable South sale leaseback and our investment interest in Bluebird. Excluding the impact of these transactions, revenue and adjusted EBITDA would each have been expected to grow 3% from the prior year. 
Revenue and adjusted EBITDA each include $55 million of cash rent associated with the GCI investments and $16 million relating to the straight line rent associated with the stream master leases and GCI investments. We expect to deploy $260 million of success-based capex at the midpoint of our guidance, of which $230 million relates to Windstream GCI investments that will mostly be weighted in the first half of 2024 versus the second half. Turning to slide 15, we expect Unity Fiber to contribute $290 million of revenues and adjusted EBITDA of $115 million at the midpoint for full year 2024 representing an EBITDA margin of approximately 40%. Core recurring revenue is expected to grow approximately 4% from the prior year. However, non-recurring revenue is expected to be significantly lower in 2024 when compared to the prior year due to the exit of most one-time equipment sales and substantially lower ETL fee revenue as a result of working through essentially all of the Sprint-related churn in 2023. Net success-based capex for Unity Fiber this year is expected to be $105 million at the midpoint of our guidance, an 11% decrease from levels in 2023, and represents a capital intensity of 36%, down from 40% in 2023. Turning to slide 16, for 2024, we expect full-year AFFO to range between $1.38 and $1.45 per diluted common share, with a midpoint of $1.41 per diluted share. On a consolidated basis, we expect revenues to be $1.2 billion and adjusted EBITDA to be $940 million at the midpoint. Our guidance contemplates consolidated interest expense for the full year of approximately $500 million. Corporate SG&A, excluding amounts allocated to our business segments, is expected to be approximately $30 million, including $8 million of stock-based compensation expense. We expect our weighted average diluted common share outstanding for full year 2024 to be around 284 million shares compared to 290 million shares in 2023, reflecting the diluted share impact related to the upcoming maturity of our existing exchangeable notes due in June of this year. As a reminder, guidance ranges for key components of our outlook are included in the appendix to our presentation. On slide 17, we have provided a tabular reconciliation of our full year 2023 results to our 2024 outlook that, that summarizes the organic contribution from our core operations, the impact from the exit of most equipment sales, lower sprint churn ETL fees, the recent asset sales, and refinancing activities. Turning now to our capital structure, we recently announced that Unity entered into an asset backed bridge loan and security agreement for up to $350 million of borrowings pursuant to a multi-draw term loan facility through an indirect bankruptcy remote subsidiary of the company. Borrowings under the facility will bear an initial interest rate equal to the term SOFR rate for the applicable interest period plus an applicable margin of 3.75% and may include customary step-ups in the applicable margin based on how long the facility remains outstanding. The facility will mature 18 months from the initial draw date and is subject to customary covenants. The ABS Bridge facility represents an important step for Unity as it provides a path to opening up access to a new source of funding with incremental leverage capacity and an attractive cost of capital. We intend to refinance the current facility in full with proceeds from a long-term ABS facility secured primarily by certain Unity Fiber network assets. At year end, we had approximately $354 million of combined unrestricted cash and cash equivalents and undrawn revolver capacity. Our leverage ratio at year end stood at 6.03 times based on net debt to last quarter annualized adjusted EBITDA. On February 22nd, our board declared a dividend of $0.15 cents per share to stockholders of record on March 28th, payable April 12th. With that, I'll now turn the call back over to Kenny. Thanks, Paul. Before closing, I'd like to make a few comments on M&A. Please keep in mind that we will not be making any specific comments on rumored potential strategic transactions involving Unity that have been circulating in recent press reports. As an asset-rich company with one of the largest fiber portfolios in the country, Unity is uniquely positioned to benefit from M&A trends that continue to highlight the value of quality fiber assets, including wholesale and fiber to the home. Over the past five years, Unity has sold or monetized nearly a billion dollars of assets at premium multiples, and we expect to continue that disciplined, ongoing review of our current asset portfolio. In addition, given our balance sheet and liquidity runway, 
We expect to be active this year evaluating transformative transactions, including the ongoing review of our current asset portfolio. Despite that, however, our primary focus, as always, will be execution of disciplined growth of our core business operations. With that, operator, we're now ready to take questions. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Greg Williams from TD Cowan. Great. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, the first one is on, on the demand uh, you are seeing on uh, Gen AI. Um, you seem somewhat bullish, but, you know, we just came back from Metro Connect this week, and, and you were there, and it seems like a lot of the fiber folks we talked to are seeing unprecedented demand, uh, really bullish. And, and your comments seem a little more gated or measured on the excitement. Maybe you can help us contextualize, you know, what you're seeing what, versus what, you know, I've been hearing from other fiber providers um, and, and how you're seeing it playing out. Um, and then just the second question is on, on the lighter bookings in the fourth quarter. You mentioned that wholesale could be lumpy. Uh, you know, is that, is that the case here? Uh, you know, and anything to call out uh, would be great. Thanks. Hey, Greg, those two questions are not unrelated. Uh, on the first point about generative AI and demand we're seeing from the hyperscalers, it's hard to not sound hysterical when expressing how excited we are about it. Uh, so if our comments and the prepared remarks seemed muted, that was probably intentional because the demand that we're seeing today, both the both today and, and in the future are tremendous. Um, we saw, a, I saw a presentation a couple weeks ago from one of our important vendors, Sienna, that showed a three and a half times increase in demand in the next few years and they were speaking in terms of zettabytes, uh, which is, a, I think, two functions removed from a terabyte. Um, and, and, and that increase in demand was almost was predominantly related to generative AI. And so I, I think the demand is, is huge. It's, we're in the midst of it now, really the early innings of it, especially for Unity, because we're, we're still putting in place MLAs with a lot of the important hyperscalers. Uh, but we're starting to see that demand, and I think it's not just uh, demand on existing network where these uh, providers are looking to acquire conduits, they're looking to acquire strands, they're looking to acquire waves. They're also interested in building a lot of new infrastructure, uh, particularly long-haul routes con con connecting new data centers. Uh, and that's exciting on multiple levels because uh, I think, there, as we all know, there's a power issue related to a lot of these new data centers, and so a lot of these guys are looking in Tier 2 and Tier 3 markets where the grids are not nearly as strained as they might be in Tier 1 markets, and so that's a nice opportunity for us there. Uh, but also, the hyperscalers are a different kind of anchor customer uh, than, than the wireless carriers, for example. Uh, they're, they're not, we're not pricing every deal to perfection, uh, if you will, and so there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a collaborative approach to building the 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 new uh, infrastructure that that's that's good for for all parties, um, and it's not nearly as reliant upon a lease up model, if you will, as as some of the wireless deals. And so there's a lot of excitement there when we're looking at building new infrastructure with the with the hyperscalers as as a as a as an anchor. And so when you tie that to to our funnel uh, for the year. Yeah, bookings look low in the fourth quarter, and they, and they are just empirically relative to, to some of the previous quarters. But I can tell you our funnel for the year is very robust. We're, we, don't, we don't give guidance on bookings, but we're showing a nice uh, uptick in, in growth for bookings for the year. And, and when you look at uh, our wholesale-heavy model, yeah, there's, there's a, a handful of deals that are always – much bigger and, and can move the needle. And when you look at some of the hyperscaler deals that we have in the funnel, there's three deals alone that represent 20, close to 25% of our total bookings that could be near-term deals. And so they just really, really could move the needle in a big way. Um, so I'm not at all concerned about the, the lower bookings number in the fourth quarter, given the, given the demand that we've got uh, staring us in the face looking, looking into 2024. And, and a lot of that is, is coming from the hyperscalers. 
Got it. If I may follow up, you mentioned that you know you're not pricing to perfection, and I guess we're also hearing that um, some of these type of skill providers are providing a large, a very large majority of the upfront costs um, to help build. And just curious, you know, what you meant by the pricing, and if you can talk about that upfront costs uh, uh, or pricing structure. Thanks. Yeah, I think you touched on it, Greg. That's generally right. And I, you know, we, we've always talked in the past about the wireless carriers, for example, and just in general when we talk about an anchor customer. We're targeting a five to ten percent initial yield, uh, and then beyond getting getting above that five to ten percent is 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 you, you know you're reliant upon a lease up model, which we've been executing on that model. But with with the hyperscalers as anchor customers, uh, you know you, you're not those you're not pricing to perfection in that five to ten percent least uh, anchor yield. You're really uh, much it's much more uh, collaborative in terms of sharing the cost of initial builds and in some cases the hyperscalers are willing to take the majority of that initial cost and and I think that that definitely uh, the economics on that are, are obviously attractive but at the same time the hyperscalers are taking a, a, a good majority of, of, of the capacity on those initial routes um, so it's 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 not necessarily a free lunch but in terms of the economics uh, it, it is attractive, and I think there's going to be a lot more new infrastructure that needs to be built by these carriers. Uh, and so, being a, a scaled fiber provider like Unity is, with a national reach, uh, we're, we're I think we're one of the go-to uh, providers for the for the for the hyperscalers on a go-forward basis. Got it. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Frank Lausen from Raymond James. Great, thank you. And Kenny, just to follow up on that, when we look at these hyperscale deals, how should we think about them ramping um, and, and hitting their full top line potential relative to traditional carriers that are, are generally a little bit slower? And then um, secondly, talk to us about the asset sales. How competitive were those? Um, did you have a lot, a lot of interest? I would assume maybe the towers do, but just curious on, uh, on what the market is for that. Thanks. Hey, Frank, I, I think for the, you know, for the hyperscalers, they, they have very different models than the wireless carriers. So I, I, I shouldn't comment on their models. Uh, I'll let them do that. But at least for, for us, when we look at the ramp and demand from them relative to the carriers, I think it's both a top line ramp and a, a profitability ramp and a capital intensity uh, decline. So if you're if you're comparing a, a, a you know a hyperscaler as an anchor customer relative to wireless carrier. You're, I think you're you're going to see less capex uh, on a net basis, uh, and I think you're going to see the same kind of mid single digit growth, but also I think more profitable deals out of the gate. Uh, so the, the, those deals are less reliant upon upon lease up, as I as I said earlier. Um, so it's just it's a tremendous amount of demand potential. Again, for Unity, uh, it's in, it, well for all carriers. You, in order to to do business with with any large customer, including the hyperscalers, you've got to get MLAs in place, which takes anywhere from six to 12 months. Uh, and and we're still in the early stages of getting that done. And and despite that, we're still seeing a, a, a huge huge demand potential. So I think once we get all those agreements in place with the right carriers or the right uh, hyperscalers, uh, we're going to see even more e even more demand in the in the coming quarters and, and years. Um, and I don't think this is a, a one year, two year phenomenon. It's it's something that's going to be sustained for 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 the foreseeable future. With respect to the asset sales, you know, as you as you know, Frank, we've been selling towers now for some time. We sold the bulk of our towers a, a couple of years ago, actually three years ago. That was a very competitive process. I think we, I think we still have the uh, distinction of having sold our towers at the highest multiple in the U.S. for a tower business. Uh, so we were very happy about that. The, the remaining towers that we've sold, uh, less competitive, just substantially fewer towers and very little revenue and EBITDA associated with them, frankly. Um, so it was really more of a bespoke transaction. And the same for the sale leasebacks uh, that we sold. Uh, there's really a large infrastructure fund that owns the two or 
loans either owns either all or or a portion of the two opcos that were the acquirers of those sale leasebacks and so it was a package deal with that uh large uh infrastructure uh, um, infrastructure fund and it worked out great for both them and us uh we think we got a good value and we think we, we think they also uh got a good value so more of a bespoke deal and speaks to uh just us having good relationships with the infrastructure uh, uh, infrastructure investor space uh, as we've had for many years, and we were able to put together a, a nice bespoke transaction that worked for both parties. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Rollins from City. Thanks and good morning. Um, just want to follow up on some of your comments, you know, on the strategic front. So, um, on, on your first one of your first few slides, you know, described a disciplined approach. Can you define that for investors in terms of how Unity thinks about discipline in terms of the types of transactions or transformative actions that can be interesting for Unity? And then I noticed that um, you may have pulled the slide on valuation that you used to include in the earnings deck. And just curious um, if there's an evolution in how you're viewing the value of the Unity franchise as you're thinking about transformative transactions. Thanks. Hey, Michael. Um, with respect to pulling slides, I'm not sure about that one. I'll have to defer that to our IR group. Uh, so I, I don't think that was really a conscious decision necessarily. But I think more importantly to your first uh, question, um, yeah, we, we've we always taken the disciplined approach to M&A, whether it's a, as a buyer or a seller. Uh, you know, we've sold assets um, at, at premium multiples, uh, whether it be towers or ground leases or, or portions of our fiber business. Um, and I think on a go forward basis, that'll continue to be our our MO if we if we do sell additional assets. And when we've been an acquirer, uh, we've also been disciplined on on acquisitions. Uh, we've paid, uh, you know, generally speaking, multiples for fiber businesses that were lower than than the market uh, at the time. Uh, and I think that's generally been the case. And I think if you look at our portfolio. Uh, we're very happy with how all of those transactions have have performed on a consolidated basis for us, with 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 the benefit of, of, of hindsight. So, using using that as 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 data uh, to to demonstrate our, our our ability to be disciplined. Um, when you look at transformative type transactions, uh, when we really the the probably the closest thing to a transformative transaction that we've done is when we. Uh, recut our MLAs with with Windstream back in during the bankruptcy, um, and we said at the time that that transaction was was a was a good, mutually beneficial transaction, and it was also a very strategic transaction. And the strategic merits of it would probably be more revealed over time, as opposed to at that point in time. And again, with the benefit of hindsight, we think that has proven to be true too. We think that's been a good transaction for for both both companies. Um, and so on a go forward basis, uh, without talking specifically about specific opportunities or deals, uh, I think you're, you're going to see us continue to be disciplined. Uh, we believe in, in mutually beneficial transactions with our potential partners. And, and I think on a go forward basis, that'll, that'll continue to be what guides us. And has there been an, an evolution in your thoughts around how to value unity in, in that context? No, I don't think so, Michael. I mean, we still feel uh, we still feel strongly about the intrinsic value of our of our business, all parts of it, uh, and and so you know I think um, public market valuations certainly ebb and flow. Private market valuations ebb and flow. The interest rate environment impacts valuations, uh, but when you look at uh, the value of our assets. When you look at our ability to, to execute on our on our strategy, and, and we think continue to put up industry leading results, both on mid single mid single mid single digit growth, and 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 just continuing to perform through uh, both uh, you know, all through all macroeconomic uh, conditions. We think that 
speaks to the value of our assets in addition to our ability to execute. And so um, we think we think our our valuation transcends a lot of those macro environment uh, impacts on ebbing, ebbing and flowing of public market valuations and private valuations. And so net net, we we don't have a different view on our intrinsic value. Thanks very much. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of David Barden from Bank of America Securities, Inc. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for taking the question. Um, two, if I could, I guess the first question would be, um, Kenny, you kind of called out um, the equipment sales um, in 2024 being a big delta for, for 2023. Is, is that like a, a, a business strategy change or is, is that uh, you know, some sort of customer category that's changing? If you could kind of elaborate a little bit um, on, on why we're assuming that, that, that all that equipment sales goes away. And then the second question is, <clears throat> and I don't know really exactly how to ask it, but there's so much about this ABS thing that I just don't understand, <laughs> um, that if you could really be um, as crystal clear as possible about why we're, we have a bridge loan to an ABS deal, and then we've got an 18-month ABS deal, and then we got a longer-term ABS deal, and what assets are behind it. So I, I think that you know, you know for the last couple quarters, you've been peppered with questions about you know, Frontier did this deal, you know, it was Dallas, it was a, it was ring fenced. It was an eight times multiple. You know, it, it was very crystal clear what they were doing and what they got out of it. And and I think that you're trying to get to that place, but I just don't understand what's what's happened on the ABS deal thus far. Thank you. Hey David, I'll let Paul uh, add some clarity to the ABS transaction. I think on your first question. So a few years ago, and when we acquired one of the made one of the acquisitions, uh, the, the company came with this business that was targeting one-time equipment sales. It was part of their business. That wasn't the reason we did the acquisition, but it was part of their business. And since then, we just continued that, that line, of, line of business. It, it's, it's something that adds a little bit of profitability e each year, uh, so we kept going with it. Uh, but at the end of last year, we decided to de-emphasize it on a go-forward basis, predominantly because, as I said in my prepared remarks, uh, it, it adds a little bit of profitability, but not enough profitability to outweigh the volatility that we see from that business on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. And it really uh, uh, flies in the face of the predictability of our core recurring business. And so... Just removing that volatility and the de minimis uh, profitability associated with it on a go-forward basis seems like the right decision, in addition to the fact that uh, it, it is a, a business line that requires some, some overhead to, to administer. So we thought the timing was particularly good because the ETL revenue from Sprint and T-Mobile is also in the rearview mirror, so that, that has also led to some volatility. So those two things together really constitute, has constituted the vast majority of any volatility in our earnings. And on a go-forward basis, we, we think there'll, there'll just be a lot less of that. And we think that's, that's ultimately good and underscores the recurring nature of our business. Um, I think, to be clear, however, that doesn't mean there will be no equipment sales. We, we do, there will be a, a small amount because we are going to continue to do it for our big, important customers. Um, it'll just be a substantially lower number than, than what, it has been, what it has been in the past. So net-net, yes, it's a strategic decision, and, and it's, it's the right decision for the business. Paul, you want to comment on ABS? Yeah, happy to uh, comment on ABS, and David, certainly appreciate your question there. I think the ABS bridge is a little bit is a little bit different. Um, I think Unity has broken some some new ground with regard to, to this facility and sort of the concept and some of the mechanics of, of how this is working. So it's a little bit different for I think folks to uh, to digest. But it's it's pretty simple um, when you boil it all down. So. It, at Unity, we, we started looking at the ABS market a little, probably about uh, nine months to, to a year ago. It's, it's something that we, we thought was an attractive long-term, could be an attractive long-term addition to, to our capital structure. So access to different 
capital market access to investment grade, uh, borrowings, um, additional leverage capacity, uh, attractive cost of capital compared to some of the other markets like the high yield market that we have traditionally tapped. So we felt like uh, it could be a really good addition to our overall long-term capital structure um, going forward. And so, um, but one of the things with ABS is it takes a fair amount of effort and time to get that set up. You've got to get all of the assets and the customer contracts associated with the fiber network that you want to securitize uh, into a bankruptcy remote um, special purpose vehicle uh, company. And that just takes just takes a fair amount of time. And so we spent some time, uh, I think we talked about this on a previous call, but we spent time with rating agencies, getting them familiar with our Unity Fiber assets in particular, and getting a confidence level that those assets and the cash flows from those assets would be well received by the, the ABS market. And, and we got uh, really good feedback from that. So that, that basically solidified our viewpoint that we wanted to add ABS to our, to our capital structure uh, on a long-term basis. But when you looked at the time it was going to take to put in the traditional ABS, we, you know, we thought it would probably take maybe up to a year to do all the work uh, to get it there. And our funding, funding need, uh, immediate funding need uh, for investing in the business, GCI and other things, was really um, more, more shorter term than that. So as we mentioned in our comments, GCI is going to be very heavily weighted to the first half of 2024. Uh, in previous years, it's been more more spread out through the year, and so we we needed to do something um, sooner than 12 months to um, uh, to take care of some of those uh, needs in terms of of our capital investments con on in the ongoing business. And so, rather than go out and do some other sort of uh, of, a, of a raise and then an ABS year from now. This ABS bridge came up as a concept that that, uh, that was attractive for us, and, and all the ABS bridge really is is um, it's a lightly securitized ABS facility that's with uh, uh, a few banks, and those banks are are basically looking at the confidence level that we have in our plan to get to a full ABS, and this uh, and lending against that. Um, lending against that lightly collateralized asset and our and our roadmap to get to a full B ABS takeout, and then the, the ABS bridge is optimized for an ABS takeout. So rather than you know doing say like a high yield add-on to one of our other bond issuances that would come with call protection and make whole and that sort of thing in order to take it out with. Uh, an ABS facility in the future, and ABS, this ABS bridge is geared specifically to be taken out by an eventual ABS. So it's it's really a a path <clears throat> a path to get us from where we stay, stand today to the full types of ABS, like you're describing with some of the other players that they've put in. So a little bit of a different approach uh, to get to the same endpoint, really. Got it. So it's like a, a, a interim step on the way to kind of getting to where. The, the final plan would look. Can you, can you re, and I apologize, could you re reiterate what the costs um, of this bridge are? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> it, it comes with a rate of, of SOFR plus 3.75%. Um, and so that, that, that rate is uh, a bit higher than what we would expect for a full ABS investment grade um, transaction when we get to that point. But again, this is a little bit of a bespoke in, uh, instrument. You know, instead of putting in all the assets, we're putting in IRUs um, uh, and uh, eventually would move in fiber assets into to this facility to do a, a, a full ABS takeout at some point. But like I said, this is collateralized a little differently. <clears throat> And, um, and so we would we would expect that the um, spreads on a full ABS deal would be would be slightly improved over this, but this is this facility is like I said um, SOFR plus 3.75, and then it has uh, some step ups uh, at month 12 and I think 15 um, to incentivize 
uh, the, the the takeout eventual takeout with a full right. ABS facility. Right. Okay. That that helps me a lot. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Simon Flannery from Morgan Stanley. Great. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, Kenny, just coming back to the hyperscale comments, any, any differences in terms of the term of these uh, leases versus the wireless uh, deals, escalators, things like that? And to what extent have you put that into guidance given you have some stuff in pipeline or is that really more exiting this year and into 25? And then I um, uh, wonder, Paul, if you could just revisit uh, your near-term and uh, medium-term leverage targets um, and uh, how you're thinking about the dividend. Uh, again, you re paid just declared another 15 cents, but what's the latest on that kind of pros and cons? Thank you. Simon, I think on uh, impact from hyperscalers in 2024, I would say it's still relatively muted versus what we think the opportunity could be because we're still in the ramp. So I think it'll be an increasing percentage of our bookings this year versus last. It's been growing, and I think it'll continue to be a higher percentage this year than previously. Uh, but bookings, as you know, precede revenue. So I think the revenue ramp, will really you'll really start to see it in 2020, 2025 and, and beyond. And, and eventually, I think the hyperscalers will be a bigger percentage of our business than the wireless carriers uh, when, we, when we reach the sort of steady state. Um, that's, that's how big the... The demand is, and and with respect to contracts, I, I wouldn't call out any material differences between the two, other than uh, what we sort of touched on earlier, which is the hyperscalers tend to be willing to to pay higher NRCs um, just to to help help fund uh, initial builds. Um, but again, it's relative, right? It, it depends on whether it's a lit deal versus a dark deal. It depends on whether it's a greenfield versus existing network. Uh, and that, that's all true of the wireless carriers as well. Uh, but I think just in general, there, there's more of a willingness to help help with, with higher NRCs at, at the outset. So, Paul, you want to talk about the balance sheet? Yeah, sure, um, Simon. So, yeah, um, in, terms of, in terms of leverage, our target leverage uh, range is still what we've always communicated as, you know, five and a half to six times is where we feel like we should be from a, from a leverage standpoint. And but we've also said that there are times uh, that we we do go above six percent uh, for periods of times, for short periods of times, and and we think that that's uh, the business can can totally handle that. But our our target is always to be in that five and a half to six times. So we ended. Uh, 2024 right at that six times um, leverage mark 6.03 is what I talked about in, in, in my remarks of so to at a slightly slightly above that one of the things I, I mentioned um, and earlier is that um, we expect GCI investments to be heavily weighted in the first half if not completely weighted in the first half of, of 2024 so there will be some incremental investment um, made in the first half of, of the year um, over the, the the second half of the year, and so I think that's likely you're likely going to see our leverage tick up a little bit in the in the first half of the half of the year. Um, you know, maybe you know that six six fifteen six point one five to six six and a quarter somewhere in there. You could see that as we work through those um, heightened investments, but then you would see that come back down in the second half of the year after those GCI commitments have been have been completed and our 2024 um, um, exchangeable notes are, are matured and, and taken off the balance sheet uh, as well so and then the effort the effort would be to, to work that back down into our um, into our target range uh, over the long term as some of those Windstream, uh, especially the windstream uh, commitments from the settlement, um, start to to wind down and ramp down into 2025 and 26. And on the dividend, yeah, yeah, Simon, on the dividend, um, <clears throat> the board uh, continues to have confidence in in the in our balance sheet, our liquidity, and and importantly in our 
in our outlook. You know, we have a very predictable <clears throat> business. We have a very predictable step down in <clears throat> capital spending, as Paul mentioned, in the coming years. And so, you know, the, the dividend is as much about the future as it is the here and now, and and, and that confidence remains remains strong. Uh, with that said, they're going to evaluate it each quarter, uh, and they're going to look at other uh, equally attractive uses of, of, of capital, including investing in the business, including M&A and other things. And so, uh, but, at, but as we sit here today, I think the dividend just uh, underscores the board's confidence in the future of the business. Great. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to turn the conference back over to Kenny Gunderman for closing remarks. Thank you. We appreciate your interest in Unity Group and look forward to updating you further on future calls. Thank you for joining us today. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.